from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. On the brief today from Hong Kong, Sophie Kamerudin on the state of the coronavirus. Alex Webb from London on Apple's taking down sales estimates as the virus hits supply chains and demand. And from Washington, Kevin Cirilli on a Nevada debate this week that will include Michael R. Bloomberg. So let's start over in Hong Kong. Thank you once again for all your great reporting over there, Sophie. Give us a sense of what's going on. As I understand, there's a lot of monitoring going on out in Ubay province. Yeah, in Hubei and across the country on Tuesday, China reported the lowest number of new cases since announcing the revised methodology to detect infections. And as we've noted, uh, the government has increased its restrictions on movements of people across the nation. And in Hubei, where some 60 million people remain on lockdown, the government there plans to sweep for unidentified patients by tracking purchases of cough or fever medicines that have been bought since January 20th. And here in Hong Kong, testing for the virus, that will include pay outpatients as well as those in emergency wards. And on Tuesday, uh, the city reported one new case of the coronavirus, bringing the total to 61. Also, David, I want to highlight we're getting some data uh, giving us a bit more insight into how the economy here in Hong Kong has been affected not only by the virus, but also by the ongoing protests. The jobless rate climbed in January for a fourth straight month, hitting the highest level since 2016. Construction, consumption, and tourist-related sectors, they were particularly hard hit here in Hong Kong. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, so because obviously this is first and foremost a human tragedy. We want to always recognize that. At the same time, there are real economic effects. You mentioned Hong Kong. We had HSBC announced they're going to lay a lot of people off. What's going on with the economy, not just in Hong Kong, but in China right now? Is it ground to a halt to a large degree? Well, we've had some um, estimates by the likes of Bloomberg Intelligence seeing that 40 to 50 percent of China's economy was open uh, for business last week, and factories are still taking time uh, to come online. And uh, we've had several companies indicate how they have been affected, uh, Apple just being one of the latest when it comes to its outlook. I also want to highlight HSBC, what it had to say regarding the virus, saying it does see a headwind there, and in the most extreme scenario, the bank does see the outbreak continuing potentially into the second half, which could make for $600 million in additional loan losses for HSBC. But the bank is still able to look past the outbreak as it aims to further uh, focus its efforts in here in Asia after the region generated about half of its revenue back in 2019, David. Okay, thank you once again so much to Sophie Cameroon over in Hong Kong. Now let's turn to one of those companies that Sophie mentioned. Alex Webb is over in London with a story on Apple. So we had this announcement Apple's going to take down its revenue numbers because of this. Why is this a big surprise? Didn't we know there were supply chain problems out in Ube? We did, but Apple had uh, at least attempted to build that into its forecast for the March quarter, the three, th three months through March. It had predicted revenue of between 63 and 67 billion dollars. Now it's saying that it's not even going to hit the lower end of that range. It hasn't also, which is creating a certain amount of anxiety, given uh, re-specified the range, um, which implies that it doesn't necessarily know when demand is going to recover. And ultimately here there are two pieces. There's the demand and the supply side because, you know, people haven't been able to leave their homes, therefore buy phones over, for example, the quite lucrative Chinese New Year period. But it's also made it a bit harder for Apple to hire the people to work in their factories. And it is just in the middle of a production ramp right now. There's expected to be a new lower cost iPhone coming next month sometime. Uh, it, when those new products come out, it brings in hundreds of thousands of people from all around China to work at its main production hubs. And it's been harder to do that because of the quarantining effect and the greater difficulty to travel in that part of the world. Yeah, a new iPhone, but you need people to make them first is the problem. And Alex, you just mentioned it. Apple it really isn't giving us a range going forward. But do we have a sense of the process? What's it going to be involved for them to get these suppliers back up and running when, in fact, they can? I, it's really about, um, you know, how travel evolves, the ability to get people in both into their own factories, but also, yeah, as you suggest, uh, get the supply chain flowing from their, from their suppliers. Now, the kind of higher tech uh, pieces of the supply chain, not least the makers of semiconductors, a lot of that manufacturing is actually done outside China. So for those guys, it's not so much of a constraint. But it might also be, there might be difficulties for them because they're unable to import their goods or export their goods to China. Uh, and in the kind of lower end gear, just, you know, they're, they're 
the cases for the iPhone, some of the circuit boards. Getting those will perhaps be a little, is still quite hard, and uh, Apple is trying very hard to, to improve that situation. Okay, Alex, thank you so much for reporting from London. That's Alex Webb, our colleague from Bloomberg Opinion. And now we turn to Kevin Cirilli and politics back here in the United States. He's in Washington, of course. So, Kevin, we have a little bit of a change now. We're going to Nevada. We're going to have a, a debate, and then we're going to have caucuses. A little bit of change. Our founder of this company and majority owner is now going to be on the debate stage. Former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg is set to make his Democratic debate debut in Nevada. Interesting, he will not be competing significantly in the Nevada caucus. It comes at a time in which his political rivals have really sharpened their attacks, David, against Bloomberg. It also comes at a time in which the president has also sharpened his attacks against him as well. Now, Senator Bernie Sanders, in his, according to sources connected to his campaign, say that they are very much looking forward to drawing an economic as well as a policy contrast to Bloomberg. It also comes when former Vice President Joe Biden is facing questions about the longevity of his campaign. Uh, Bloomberg has not faced a, a debate. He has not uh, really gone into the fray, so to speak, uh, as it would uh, stand. Uh, but his campaign says that their strategy is going to be to really compete on Super Tuesday. But, take, Kevin, take it forward to the caucus, where Michael Bloomberg is not going to be competing. Are we confident that they could pull off that caucus after the Iowa experience? Because I hear some complications there, even in Nevada. Well, look, I mean, it's a great question in terms of election security. You, we all covered the debacle that was in Iowa as it relates to the caucus. Uh, the, a, an entirely different apparatus uh, is going to be looking after Nevada. Uh, but it's a, it's a great question in terms of what happens. Uh, there just seems to be a lot of volatility in this race. Uh, but from the Sanders and Buttigieg perspective, they feel that they have emerged as the two front runners uh, following the last several weeks of the race. Okay, we'll find out Saturday night. Thank you so much to Kevin Cirilli in Washington. And now it's time to check in on the markets and see how they're reacting, if they are, to today's top stories. Joining us now is Kayla Line. So I think probably coronavirus. Coronavirus and Apple is a big one here. Yeah. So that revenue warning from Apple, remember, that is one of the biggest companies there is. It has a 4.7% weighting in the S&P 500. So as Apple goes, the broader indexes usually go. And with Apple down nearly 3%, that is really dragging on tech stocks in particular, but also the S&P 500, which is right around the lows of the session, down about 7 tenths of 1%. And beyond just the fact that it's a stock moving, it's one of a number of companies we've heard from recently warning about the implications of the coronavirus. And that's raising some fresh concerns about the ultimate impact it is going to have. As a result, you're seeing investors kind of skewing away toward from equities more toward safer assets like U.S. Treasuries and gold. And as you suggest, Kayla, it's not just Apple. I mean, we have the SOX as well. We always look at those to see how we're doing. How are we doing? Not well. The SOX index is now down about 2%. 29 of 30 stocks within that index are lower. And the semiconductors are really being hit with kind of a double whammy today because you do have Apple on the one hand. That is taking Apple suppliers like Skyworks, which gets about 50% of its revenue from Apple lower. But then you also have fresh trade concerns. Reports overnight that the U.S. is uh, considering new trade restrictions on U.S. chip gear as, you know, clamping down more on Huawei, and that's affecting other companies like Lam Research, KLA, which are both down about 4% today. So they're kind of getting hit on both ends here. Okay, Kelly, thank you so much for the report on the markets. That's Kelly Lyons. And now we turn to Mark, Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. Mark? David, a viral outbreak that began in China has infected more than 73,000 people globally. The death toll is approaching 1,900. One of those fatalities, a senior doctor at a hospital in Wuhan where the outbreak began. Again. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres says the outbreak is, quote, not out of control, but is still what he calls a very dangerous situation. The United States is slapping sanctions on a unit of Russian oil giant Rosneft for helping Venezuela evade an embargo on its oil. Senior administration officials warned today that anyone in the world doing business with Rosneft could also be sanctioned. It is part of a U.S. campaign to push Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro to step down. The corruption trial of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu will begin March 17th, two weeks after national elections. Netanyahu is charged with bribery and fraud, accused of accepting lavish gifts from wealthy friends and scheming with media moguls to trade regulatory favors for positive news coverage. The Prime Minister failed to secure victory in a pair of deadlocked elections last year. The jury in the Harvey Weinstein rape trial has begun deliberating. At least 100 women have accused the former movie mogul of sexual abuse. But this trial involves accusations from two women. 
Weinstein says any sexual conduct was consensual. He could face life in prison if convicted. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks so much, Mark. Coming up, we talk Nevada politics and a newly expanded debate with our panel. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's official. Michael Bloomberg, the founder and majority owner of our company, will be on the debate stage out in Las Vegas tomorrow night ahead of this weekend's Nevada caucuses. To take us through the shifting political scene, we welcome now here in New York, Basil Smeichel. He's former executive director of the New York State Democratic Party. And from Washington, Greg Swenson. He is Brig McAdam founding partner and spokesman for Republicans Overseas UK. So I'm going to start with you, Basil. We always make a disclaimer, Mike Bloomberg owns Bloomberg LP, no question about it. You also have done some work for him on a campaign. I did in 2009, the re-elect. Okay, so what is having up on that stage going to do? Well, it gives uh, folks like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren to sort of sharpen their uh, progressive uh, credentials. You'll see Biden on the attack a little bit also. But the truth, but you know, Warren and, and Sanders are going to be trying to pull everybody to the to the left. But the truth is that for Pete Buttigieg and Joe Biden, they're going to be fighting Bloomberg for the center lane because there are a lot of folks now that seeing Biden sort of suffer in the polls are giving Mike Bloomberg an, a look. And that, I think, has to be scary for someone like Joe Biden. Pete Buttigieg is a little different because he represents, you know, a lot of different sort of aspects of what Democrat the Democratic elector is looking for. But I think for Joe Biden, this is going to be a really important point for him to fight through uh, that center lane. Greg, give us a perspective, if you can, from a Republican point of view. I mean, there are some people who think that President Trump would like to run against Bernie Sanders because he is more extreme, more progressive. Uh, does having another solid moderate who's strong, does that actually hurt the president potentially? Yeah, I think it's I think the easy path for the president would be facing, you know, a, a Jeremy Corbyn type of, of <laughs> candidate like you'd see in Bernie Sanders. And look how that worked out for labor in the U.K. So I think that would be the best option for the president. But look, I always I always warn, you know, you, you don't really want what you wish for. Um, I think of Bernie Sanders, who, who rallies the party behind him, much like President Trump did in 2016 you know, can actually have a chance at winning. And I think that's not uh, something that, that, you know, the Republicans or the president uh, w wants. And it's not good for the party and it's not good for the country to have a Marxist or a socialist, you know, leading uh, once what was once a great party. So, look, I think it would be easier in terms of the general election, but I don't think it would be good for the for the country. Greg, give us a perspective. You have a particular perspective because you're based in London. You're in Washington, David. You're based in London. You represent a lot of companies doing business around the world, often with p potential U.S. involvement. How do businessmen overseas, American businessmen, perceive the Trump administration versus, for example, uh, 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 Joe Biden or a Bernie Sanders or a Mike Bloomberg, for that matter? Yeah, I mean, I think to I'll answer the question, you know, first with the president and then and then with the, the Democratic candidates. I mean, the, the business people around the world actually like this president. They like what he's done. They wish their own governments would take a page out of the U.S. playbook and reduce regulations, reduce taxation, you know, let let the let the economy, um, you know, let the private sector work. Um, it's better for growth. It's better for wages. Um, they get that. And, and so there's a really good perspective, especially in the countries that have suffered under some sort of socialist model, or especially in Eastern Europe, um, where those countries suffered for, uh, you know, under, over, under the Soviet Union, under communi communism for 75 years, those people understand it, and they don't want any part of this socialist model that's being promoted uh, both in the UK by, by Mr. Corbyn and, and in the US by, by Bernie Sanders. So um, as, as far as the Democrats, you know, look, I, I don't think anybody really takes Bernie Sanders seriously in Europe. Um, sometimes I think they should, because the fact that he's getting such a high percentage of the young vote is, um, should be worris worrisome to all of us. But um, I think they would respect Mr. Bloomberg much more because he's a successful business person. Um, I just don't think that's going to sell well in today's Democratic Party, where, you know, success and capitalism is, is kind of viewed, um, you know, or looked down upon by by many on the party's, you know, far progressive left 
flank. I don't think well, that's going to work in the primaries, but I think in the general election it might have some appeal to some moderate moderate Republicans. So let's ask somebody who's worked for the Democratic Party yeah. here in the United States, Basil. What about uh, Greg's point here? Is there a ro room? Tom Steyer says you got to take the president on on the economy. Is there room for someone in the Democratic Party to take the president on, given the strength of this economy? I, I think there is, but it's a very nuanced argument. It's not necessarily an argument that says that the economy isn't doing well, because I think if you, but I also think if you accept the argument, you're also accepting the president's premise right. that he made it better. So there has to be a bit of a wedge, and that wedge could be affordability, it could be economic security. Uh, you know, if you see countries, uh, companies freezing or canceling pensions, or the fact that the you know minimum wage isn't going up in every state, for example, there is some real concern. From if you're older, if you're younger, about whether or not you can actually afford to live where you are. But that wedge that you describe yeah. actually pushes you a little bit in the Jeremy Corbyn direction, doesn't I, it? I don't listen. It's a tricky argument. <laughs> There's no question about it. And and I think, but I think if you going to Greg's point earlier, if you look at where the enthusiasm and the mm -hmm. movement is around the party, it's around those issues, and it's around a Sanders, it's around a, a, a Warren, and that's why Joe Biden is having this really difficult time trying to argue for a real center lane. So the question is, is, if a Mike Bloomberg starts to do very well going forward, particularly as we get to April in New York and, and some of these other states that are going to be voting, are voters going to say, look, where we, what we really want is someone that understands how to go after this president and how to keep us going in the same direction without some of the challenges that this particular president provides. And that's kind of what the Bloomberg argument is. Uh, Greg, does the president have a challenge potentially, potentially on his platter today that he didn't have a month or two ago, and that is the aftermath of this coronavirus? Because that seems to be a bit of a wild card right now in the economy globally and potentially over the United States as well. Will the president be tested and how he can manage that if, in fact, there is something of a downturn? Yeah, I mean, so far so good uh, in terms of how the crisis has been managed, you know, by the United States, by this government. But I think that there's some things you just can't control. And if there's a slowdown in global growth, I mean, you're going to see it, obviously, in the cruise business. You're going to see it. You've already seen it in airlines. They're going to take a big hit. Big hit. So, look, I think we're all worried about what this can do to global growth and, and, and the effect that it'll have on the U.S. economy. Um, he's just going to have to be, try to be articulate in explaining that, you know, that his policies have worked, and I think he's done a good job of messaging there, that his policies have worked, um, especially for the for lower income uh, quartile that's, you know, whose wages are up significantly more than, than high income earners. So wage growth is really important. I think that's what he's got to highlight because we have to expect there'll be some GDP slowdown from, from the uh, coronavirus. Okay, thanks very much to our political panel. Basil Smokler here with me in New York and Greg Swenson joining us from Washington. Good Breaking news now, Macy's long-term credit rating has been cut to junk by S&P. It now has a double B-plus rating. The struggling department store chain has more than $4 billion in bonds and loans outstanding, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. HSBC shook up the banking world with its announcement today that it would be laying off 35,000 employees over the next three years. Look to save $4.5 billion in costs and take a $7.3 billion charge. The HSBC CFO, Ewan Swenson, uh, talked earlier with Bloomberg Television. We are shrinking in areas where we think that we have uh, clear underperformance. And, and a lack of long-term sustainable competitive advantage. Equally in today's plan, what you see is significant investment in those parts of the business where we do think we have competitive advantage and we can grow. So I think we're absolutely uh, doing both of those things. Yeah, it, it definitely was an interesting comment from one of the shareholders and sort of laid the, the options for HSBC, Ewan, as, as fairly binary. What you're saying is that you're kind of balancing um, the, those two sides of the coin. Are you happy um, that you're getting the balance right from those two binary options? You know, we think this, uh, this is the right thing for the bank to do, the right plan for now. Uh, we, we've definitely, uh, we are looking to invest $100 billion of risk-weighted assets, around $14 to $15 billion of capital in the next three years in parts of the business that are performing well, particularly Asia. So we do think this is the right balance. It's coupled with a very substantive cost reduction program. 
coupled with organisational simplification to allow us to speed up the pace of execution, we think it's a great plan. You just pick up on the risk weighted assets. I, I, I could say to you probably you're at that moment of leaning into not bad asset price markets and a hunger for yield. The risk weighted assets you're going to sell, just a little bit more complexion on them before we go. Yeah, well, uh, unsurprisingly, it's in uh, parts of the business, you know, the markets business and global banking and markets. I think we are intending to exit uh, a lot of domestically focused customers in Europe and the U.S. on the global banking side. Uh, and we're also going to exit uh, international customers that are not producing acceptable returns today. Uh, so I think we're going to be quite uh, surgical and ruthless in terms of targeting those parts of the business where we're not generating acceptable returns, we're going to take those risk-weighted assets and reinvest them in parts of the business where we can see much better returns. That was HSBC CFO Ewan Stevenson speaking to Bloomberg's Daybreak Europe earlier today. It's time now for the stock of the hour. ConAgra Brands is the worst performer in the S&P 500. The stock is dropping nearly 8% and on pace for its worst day since June after cutting its sales and earnings forecasts. Kayla Lines is here with more, and this one apparently is not coronavirus, at least not yet. <laughs> <laughs> it is not yet, but they are still taking down expectations ahead of their earnings next month. Essentially, they're saying organic sales for the full fiscal year are going to be flat to up half a percent. They previously saw that growth as as high as one and a half percent. And on earnings, what was the high end of their forecast of $2.07, or excuse me, the low end, is now the high end. The company is placing blame for this on weakness in the third quarter. They say they were prepared for tougher comps year on year, but they just weren't expecting this level of category weakness. They say it really started in food service in restaurants. They say restaurant traffic in the holiday quarter was a lot lower than last year, and that's a, a segment that made up about 10 percent of its business, so that area of weakness. And they said that bled through to retail in January as well. And that point is interesting to me because Kanaka's top customer is Walmart. It makes yeah. up about 25 percent of its sales, and we know that Walmart was also out with disappointing fourth quarter so You've got uh, retail, well. you've got restaurants. Does it tell us something about the consumer? It may. It may tell us something about the consumer in the sense that Walmart isn't the only one that has war warned on this holiday quarter. Target did the same thing. And on Conagra, the fact that restaurant traffic was lower may tell yeah. us a little bit about discretionary spending. That said, it may tell us more about how retailers are competing with Amazon and how Conagra is competing with changing consumer taste than it does about the health of the consumer. Yeah, overall. not a good deal for Conagra. Okay, thanks so much to Kayla Lines for that report. Now we have breaking news. Another one. Renault's long-term credit rating has been cut to junk by Moody's. The French auto automaker was downgraded to BA1 rating. The outlook remains stable. The company has more than 26 billion euros in public bonds and loans outstanding. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. From New York, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, the Department of Homeland Security is waiving 10 federal contracting laws to speed construction of a wall at the U.S.-Mexico border. They include requirements for having open competition and justifying selections. The move is expected to spark criticism that the Trump administration is overstepping its authority, but similar legal challenges in the past have failed. The United Nations says government forces must allow humanitarian aid into conflict areas in northwest Syria. Speaking in Geneva today, the UN human rights chief added it was, quote, cruel beyond belief that civilians are living under plastic uh, sheeting in freezing conditions while getting bombed. The comments come a day after Syria pledged to press ahead with a military campaign that has displaced hundreds of thousands of people. In Afghanistan, election officials say President Ashraf Ghani has won a second term. The election commission says Ghani got just over 50 percent of the vote. His challenger, Abdullah Abdullah, received 39 percent. The election took place in September. Results were repeatedly delayed amid accusations of misconduct and technical problems with counting ballots. President Trump has pardoned Edward DeBartolo Jr., the former San Francisco 49ers owner, convicted in a gambling fraud scandal in 1998. 
DeBartolo pleaded guilty to failing to report a felony when he paid $400,000 to former Louisiana Governor Edwin Edwards in exchange for a riverboat gambling license. He avoided prison, was fined $1 million, and was suspended for a year by the National Football League. But the incident effectively ended his NFL career. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks very much, Mark. Apple shook markets with its announcement. This, they would miss revenue targets because of the coronavirus and effects on its supply chain. There, and there's good reason to believe Apple may not be the last company with those sorts of problems. Welcome now to someone whose practice it is to navigate Western companies through China's legal waters. Dan Harris is a co-founder of Harris Brick and Law Firm and co-author of the celebrated China Law Blog. He comes to us today from Seattle over the telephone. So, Dan, thanks so much for joining us. First of all, give us a sense of what's going on on the ground as far as you know. You represent a lot of companies over there. Uh, what is really going on? To what extent is the Chinese economy, at least in the Ubei province, really frozen? Well, in that province, it's basically completely frozen. It's outside that province where everything just really depends. So, so do you have a sense overall of the Chinese economy? There have been various estimates coming out of banks and others about the extent to which GDP growth will be reduced. Do you have a sense of how accurate those estimates really are? I think they're pretty inaccurate. Mm -hmm. I think it's very difficult to get a handle on what's going on in China uh, with respect to the impact of the coronavirus. We're basically telling our clients who are asking, when will we get our products? Our answer is, you will get them when you get them. It's impossible, even factory by factory, to predict what's going to happen. Because even if a factory opens up, that doesn't mean that they'll have the people they need to fix their uh, equipment. It doesn't mean they'll be able to get the product to the port. It doesn't mean they'll be able to get the product to leave the port. Dan, do you have a sense of whether the regime, the government, President Xi on down, really knows what's going on, or it's just moving too fast for it to keep up? That's a great question. I think it generally knows what's going on. I don't think it's revealing to the world what's going on. Which is to say you think it's worse than what we're hearing? I think it's way worse. And one of the reasons I say that is based on what I am hearing from friends in China, in various different cities, and even people who read our blog who write us. And they are basically saying people, and these are in cities like Shanghai and Beijing, people are not going out. I have a friend, he went to the office one day, they were supposed to go that day, and they were afraid to turn on the heat for fear that the virus would pass through the pipes. So despite the fact that they were there that day, they all ended up leaving an hour or two later because they were freezing. And you take that and you multiply it across China and you have a disaster. And I keep reading about how Rumors are Foxconn's at 10 percent capacity. Volkswagen hasn't opened up yet. If these big, sophisticated companies are basically nowhere, just imagine that small company that's making um, widgets for sale on Amazon. We're talking with Dan Harris. He's a co-founder of the Harris Brick and Law Firm, does a lot of work over in China. So as you describe this situation, how do companies go about planning what to do? I mean, can they have workarounds? Are there other supply chains they can tap into, or does that take too long? It, for most, it takes too long. And the problem is most of these companies, these small and mid-sized companies, have no plan B. That was sort of given up 10 years ago when China started operating smoothly. So we get people who are saying, hey, can you help us get into Thailand or Vietnam? And we're like, sure, uh, but we're talking probably at least six months until you have anything. Uh, and then they panic. And the other problem that's really being underrated here is, let's say you get into Thailand or Vietnam right now. Um, we had a client who told us, well, I'm so glad we're, we have half our production in Vietnam right now. It's really going to save us. And my response was essentially, what are you talking about? Half your components come from China. Mm. Yeah, that and that's the situation. 
that really complicated supply chain. I exactly right. Do you have a sense uh, if, in fact, we thought it had peaked and things were getting better, how long it would take just to get things back up and running? Because even if you've gotten past the coronavirus, you can't necessarily just turn a switch and get all these the supply chains started up right away again. Well, on that, I'm actually somewhat optimistic, meaning if the coronavirus were to disappear today, I would think China could be back to something very close to normal within as little as 30 days. Because to, to that extent, it would be very much like returning after Chinese New Year's. 85 percent of the workers tend to return. Things are back to normal again, you know, in one to four weeks. And so if, if the coronavirus were truly eliminated, then I don't think it would take all that long. And that begs the big question, which is, when will the coronavirus truly be eliminated? Yeah, it sounds like we don't have anything approaching an answer. At least we don't have it yet at this at this point. So uh, then address the question that people are asking, investors are asking, people in the markets are asking, which is, is this likely to be a V sort of downturn where it bounces right back whenever that point is, more of a U where it stays down for a while and comes back, or could it actually be an L? Could there be longer-term repercussions for, for example, Western companies doing business in China? Well, I don't. I, I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to venture to guess what kind of um, what it's going to look like for the U.S. But I think I know what it'll look like for China, and I think what it'll look like for China is that China, at least on the manufacturing side, will very quickly return close to normal, and then it will go into a long-term slide. And the reason I say it will go into a long-term slide is because these companies have been burned so badly by manufacturing in China over the last year and a half. Uh, I mean, before the coronavirus, things were bad due to tariffs, due to duties, due to Chinese companies acting worse than they usually do for fear that their Western buyers would abandon them. So you take all that, you take the coronavirus, you take what we are hearing from our clients, and they are not going to be able to get out of China fast enough. So I see a huge number of companies realizing that they cannot keep putting all their manufacturing eggs in just the China basket. And so I see a lot of them leaving China entirely, and I see a lot of them actually starting to diversify. And I think that's going to be you know, over a six month to three year time frame. So Dan, finally, you advise clients in dealing not just with China, but with the Chinese government. It strikes me that President Xi is really being tested right now. He is on the hot speed, maybe in a way that he hasn't since he's taken over as president there. What do you advise clients about what that means for them? On the one hand, that's really good news because he can't leave it short. He's got to get fixed. On the other hand, is it bad news because it really may put pressure on him and his regime? That's also a great question. And it's a question, a similar question to one that we have dealt with during every China down, economic downturn. And um, I actually, this morning, went back and read all the things that we have written on how to deal with China during an economic downturn. And typically what we say is buckle up because China, the Chinese government, and that'll be true whether it's Xi or anyone else, will try to show to the Chinese people that it can be tough on foreigners for the benefit of the Chinese people. So we always say during economic downturns, you, it's even more important to comply with every Chinese law. Yeah. But what I'm also seeing, which is interesting, is China they're not publicizing this because they don't want to appear desperate, but China is desperate. Yeah, okay. Good advice, though. Buckle up. I'll have to remember that. Thank you, many thanks to Dan Harris. He is partner of Harris Brick and Law Firm and also co author of the China Law Blog. We're going to have more with him coming up in our second hour on Bloomberg Radio. Coming up here, though, right now, the United States appeared to lay down the gauntlet to its European allies at the Munich Security Conference over the weekend. Was it really as confrontational as it looked from the outside? We talked with someone who was there, former U.S. Ambassador to Germany, John Emerson. That's going up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. U.S. leaders met with their European counterparts at the security conference over in Munich over the weekend with some contentious issues on the agenda, including European dealings with the Chinese tech company Huawei. And Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi made it clear that when it comes to Huawei, the U.S. concerns are not, uh, they are bipartisan. They're not partisan. I do believe that if we were to let Huawei have the information highway dominance, it would be like putting uh, the uh, state police in the pocket of every person who uses that highway. John Emerson was U.S. Ambassador to Germany under President Obama, and he attended that Munich conference. He is now the chairman of the American Council on Germany. He comes to us today from Los Angeles, fresh off the plane, I think, John. Thank you so much for being with us. So give us a sense, really, of this Huawei concern, because it does sound like Nancy Pelosi is joined at the hip with Mike Pompeo, and at least on this issue, the, the Europeans get it. The United States really feels strongly about this. Well, they certainly do now. You know, there's always been an assumption, I think, uh, among the Europeans that given the polarization in our country, uh, if Trump is for it, uh, Pelosi and the Democrats are going to be against it. That assumption was clearly shattered from the main stage of the Munich Security Conference with, uh, with Nancy Pelosi's comments there. I think the European perspective, though, um, is two things. Number one, they clearly understand that 5G is not simply a better version of 4G. It's a difference in kind rather than a difference in degree. And I think they've bought into the idea that it's not just important to have 5G, it's important to have a secure 5G. And of course, the question is, what does that mean? Uh, and the, the real issue that I think a lot of Europeans have is they have very important uh, economic relationship with China summed up best by the defense minister from Australia who said, by far, our largest economic relationship, large, our largest trading relationship is with China. By far, our largest security relationship is with the United States. So I think they feel that they're a bit caught in the middle. So that's, that's something that they're wrestling with. And then the second piece of this is, well, what's your alternative? Because the, the Americans are saying, don't use Huawei, but we aren't really at a place where we can offer a cost-effective alternative. So there was a lot of discussion on the margins of, in some of these side events, including one that we, the American Council on Germany, sponsored, uh, about how we get from here to there in terms of providing an alternative. But, John, it sounds like the stakes couldn't be much higher. You had your successor, Richard Grinnell, saying, basically the president instructed him to say, if the Europeans go ahead and deal with Huawei, they'll cut him off from intelligence sharing. That's awfully serious for NATO, isn't it? Yeah, but we didn't see that with the Brits. Uh, you know, the, uh, I mean, maybe it will happen, but uh, uh, the Brits tried to, you know, in effect, uh, have it both ways, say they won't use uh, Huawei for uh, anything that's sort of sensitive or security related, but they will uh, allow um, uh, Huawei components or whatever to be used uh, for sort of non-secure um, uh, activities or, or functions. And, uh, and we'll see whether or not that works. I, I did speak to a couple of people from the intelligence community about that. And um, they said, um, you know, off the record, uh, but basically that's probably a workable solution. So maybe that's why the administration, apart from the president's uh, well-reported uh, anger with Boris Johnson and frustrated phone call with him, uh, that may be um, uh, where, they're, where they're coming from on that. But. Uh, but you're right. I mean, the, the, the stakes have been raised. Um, I happen to, from what I've seen and the folks in the intelligence community I've spoken with, uh, I happen to believe that this is a very serious issue. I find it stunning that the country that invented, in effect, uh, social media and this whole new uh, level of technology that we're, uh, we're into uh, doesn't have the lead on this now. Of course, Huawei uh, stole a lot of the uh, you know, the wonderful IP that American companies had created over the years to help, uh, you know, jump this far. And because of the subsidization of the company, they're able to underprice companies like Nokia and Ericsson that are also trying to do the same thing. So that's clearly something we need to address. I was encouraged by comments at our side event uh, that Robert Blair, who's the uh, National Security Council expert on um, technology, made about efforts that are being made to try to 
move us um, towards having a genuine alternative. Let's turn back to Germany, the country that you are ambassador to as practical matter. Angela Merkel is having a bit of a trouble, I think it's fair to say, in her leadership situation. How vulnerable is she? Because it sounds like people are saying, we don't want you to last out your term as chancellor if you can't figure out what to do within the party. Well, she's had trouble uh, forming a coalition in the first place after the 2017 elections and then uh, after a series of setbacks when she decided a year and change ago to step down as party chair. And now, obviously, this situation where her successor, chosen successor, AKK, Annegret Kramp karrenbauer um, decided to step down as well. But I've been saying from the beginning, and I'll continue to say today, I really believe Angela Merkel will serve out her full term until uh, the elections in September of 2021. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Number one, don't forget that she is about to uh, assume the presidency of the European Council starting uh, this summer. It's a six-month term, but it's pretty consequential. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, a lot in the German political structure are uh, aware of that and don't want to give up the opportunity that provides for Germany. For one thing, they have scheduled Germany hosting for the European Council a summit with China in the fall of 2020 and certainly would like Angela Merkel with her experience and knowledge and prestige to be, um, to be chairing that. Uh, so, of course, the question is, who succeeds her? Uh, she's al already indicated a while ago that she wasn't going to uh, run again for chancellor. So who succeeds her in the party leadership? And, and presumably that person will then be the, her party, the CDU's chancellor candidate. Uh, and, uh, and so there's a lot of conversation about that. Uh, my guess is that in the next couple of weeks, the CDU will announce a timetable for making that decision. It will probably end up with uh, not the normal party conference in December, which AKK said she'd like to do. It'll be sooner than that, maybe May or June. There'll be an extraordinary party conference to choose that person. But, um, uh, but I think everybody's cognizant of two things. Number one, uh, that it's important for Merkel to stay in her chancellorship through, at minimum, the, the period of uh, uh, being the president of the European Council. And then secondly, um, uh, I think there's a, uh, there's a sense that it, while everybody I talk to, journalists, uh, political operatives, party leaders, uh, is about as confused about who might win this contest as Democrats are about who might earn <laughs> the right to challenge Donald Trump. Uh, but one thing everybody knows for sure, for sure, the next German government will have the Greens in the coalition. And the only question is whether the Greens are at the top and have the chancellorship or the coalition partner, perhaps, with, uh, with the CDU. And so that it, it, there's a lot of thinking about who would be the best candidate uh, to make sure that the CDU comes in first or the CDU-CSU combination right. comes in first. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion about that. So um, okay. uh, I think we'll know a lot more in May or June, but I am confident that Angela Merkel will certainly be in the chancellorship through the end of the year. Right. And if she is through the end of the year, it really doesn't make sense to hold elections when they're already set, I mean, in January or February, when they're already set for September. So okay. I think she'll fill out her term, and that's clearly her intention. Right, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. That's John Emerson. He's former U.S. Ambassador Thanks, to Germany under President Obama and current chairman of the American Council of Germany. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The U.S. is sanctioning a unit of Russia's largest oil producer, Rosneft, over its ties to Venezuela. Here to explain what the sanctions are and how they may affect the oil market is Simon Casey of Bloomberg News. So, Simon, thanks for being here. So I'm actually sort of surprised they hadn't done this already, but explain exactly what this Rosneft agency does. Well, this, the, the sanctions announced today target specifically the trading arm of Rosneft. It's yeah. based in Switzerland. It also targets the chairman of that particular unit. It's effectively another turn of the screw. I mean, already there's a, a wide array of sanctions placed by the U.S. government on Venezuela and companies doing business, preventing them from doing business with Venezuela. But still, uh, despite the, the country's oil production really you know, a, a shadow of its former self, yeah. 
the oil that's coming out of the country, predominantly it's going to places like China and India, it's, it's coming via Rosneft. So this is a fi another, yet another attempt to try and cut that off. So Secretary of State Mike Pompeo tweeted about it, saying that this is Maduro's, that is the head of um, Venezuela, at least one of the heads of Venezuela, main lifeline to evade our sanctions. Is that overstating or is that accurate? Is this the main way that they were selling oil? It's certainly, it's, it's, it's not a total overstatement, no. This is, a, this is a very important source of hard cash, and Venezuela is obviously terribly dependent upon any kind of cash it can get its hands on. Um, and it's, and it's going to hurt them, for sure. But the, the, the other question really now is what is going to happen with other, com other companies involved investing, uh, op operating, I should say, within Venezuela. Now, oh. Chevron is has got a waiver from the State Department for uh, it's due to expire in April. Yeah. Now, there's been a lot of speculation, will it continue to be allowed to operate there? Yeah. They are producing a, a small amount of what they historically have done, right. but uh, th they could be on their way out. But another screw to tighten, perhaps. Exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you so much to Bloomberg's Simon Casey for that report on Venezuela and Rosneft. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to talk about a new plan that could help ease inequality in schools, at least in the state of Maryland. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.